Good morning to our participants in the US. Good afternoon to our participants in Europe. Very warm welcome to the second online session of our KAS AICGS Transatlantic Trade Week. Where are transatlantic trade relations headed? China, the WTO, and climate change. This online series over the course of three days is jointly hosted by the German Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, or in English, Konrad Adenauer Foundation, and the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at Johns Hopkins University. My name is Paul Linnartz. I'm head of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung office to the US in Washington, DC. Our first session yesterday was about engagement versus enforcement. How can the United States and Germany manage China's impact on the global economy? Today, we are going to deal with reforming the World Trade Organization. Can the United States and the European Union find common ground? And tomorrow we will focus on reconciling trade policy and climate goals. In our first session yesterday with Peter Bayer, <coughs> Wendy Cutler and Christoph Schemionik, the focus was on China. Yet, of course, the discussion also touched upon the WTO and the question if the World Trade Organization is the best place to find ways to respond to China's subsidies of its state-owned enterprises, among other questions. Today, dear ladies and gentlemen, the World Trade Organization is at the very center of the discussion. As mentioned in the invitation, the US and the EU appear to be growing closer on both their understanding of where the WTO is falling short and what to do about it. This webinar will examine how to modernize the WTO's negotiating, monitoring, and dispute resolution functions with a particular focus on where there is a need for new rules and how to shape them within a multilateral trading system. Within the next, let's say, 60 minutes, we will also analyze the role of plurilateral agreements in areas like subsidies and state-owned enterprises as a stepping stone to WTO reform. For this, I would like to warmly welcome Dr. Sabine Weyand, Director General for Trade of the European Commission. Dr. Weyand will kindly deliver the opening remarks. Thank you so much for being with us today. For the discussion, we will be, she will be joined by Ambassador Rufus Yakta, President of the National Foreign Trade Council, NFTC, and former Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization for 11 years. And last but not least, Professor Gabriel Felbermeier, President of the Kiel Institute for the Global Economy. Thank you so much to you as well for being with us today. But before we get started, dear ladies and gentlemen, I would again like to express my sincere gratitude to Jeff Raske, president of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies, for his excellent cooperation. Again, I would also like to sincerely thank Peter Rashish, senior fellow and director of the DO Economics Program at AICGS. Peter has already done a great job yesterday, and he will also lead us through today's and tomorrow's discussion. I'm very much looking forward to it. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul, uh, and let me offer uh, our welcome as well uh, on behalf of AICGS. Uh, Paul, as you mentioned, um, it does seem as if the US and, and the EU are growing closer on, on what to do about the challenges that, that are facing the WTO. It's got, it won't be an easy task to, to uh, find some uh, avenues for reform and progress, but they are, they are urgent. Um, most of the WTO's rules are 25 years old. Uh, and but global trade hasn't stood still in that time, becoming more digital, more impacted by climate change. And I think you could also say more characterized by diversity and even some disorder with the rise of China, as well as the increasing demands that citizens are placing on trade policy. And um, uh, because I think of the perceived challenges the WTO uh, has, is, has in keeping up with the times, uh, we are also seeing, I think, more calls for like-minded countries to work together to advance new trade rules and trade enforcement mechanisms. I think we're hearing those calls in the United States and, and the European Union as well. Um, let me uh, briefly introduce um, our three speakers today. As Paul mentioned, um, we are very uh, grateful that Dr. Sabina Vayand uh, will provide us with, an, with opening remarks. She is, of course, the Director General for Trade at the European Commission. 
Before assume, assuming her current position, she played an important role in EU trade policy as the deputy chief negotiator of the European Commission Task Force on Brexit from October 2016 to May 2019. She's also served as director and the secretary general of the commission in charge of policy coordination on economic, social, and environmental policies from 2014 to 2016. Since joining the commission in 1994, she's held prominent roles as well in the cabinets of Pascal Ami, uh, of Commission President Barroso, and of Louis Michel. She has studied at Freiburg, Cambridge, and the College of Europe, and holds a PhD from the University of Tübingen. Uh, Ambassador Rufus Yerkes is president of the National Foreign Trade Council, as Paul mentioned. It's one of the leading Washington-based business associations. He has previously served as staff director of the Subcommittee on Trade for the Committee on Ways and Means of the U.S. House of Representatives in the 1980s. And in the following six years, he held, he held the role of deputy U.S. trade representative under both Republicans and Democrats uh, when they were in the White House, first based in Geneva as our ambassador there and then in Washington. He then spent five years in the private sector, uh, part of that time based in Brussels. Uh, and from 2002 to 2013, he served as Deputy Director General of the WTO. Currently, he's also a visiting professor with the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. Uh, he has received his BA from the University of Washington, his JD from Seattle University School of Law, and an LLB in International Law from the University of Cambridge. Professor Gabriel Ferbermeyer is president of the Kiel Institute for the Global Economy, a position he assumed in March 2019. He concurrently holds a chair in economics and economic policy at Kiel University. He's been a consultant with McKinsey, an assistant professor at the University of Tübingen, and held a chair in international economics at the University of Hohenheim. From 2010 to 2019, he led the IFO Center for International Economics at the University of Munich, where he also served as a full professor in international economics. He's a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the German Federal Ministry of Economics and Energy and associate editor of the European Economic Review and the Journal of the European Economic Association. He has studied at the University of Linz, University of Tübingen, and received his uh, PhD from the European uh, University in Florence. Um, so I'm glad to see that both the University of Tübingen and the University of Cambridge are so well represented uh, among today's panelists. Um, before I hand over the floor with pleasure to Sabina Vayan, um, let me just give you a few housekeeping, um, uh, just speak, get, offer a few housekeeping remarks. Uh, after Sabina's remarks, uh, I will ask the panelists for their comments on her, on what she on, on her remarks, and then we'll have a round of discussion among uh, all three of our speakers. After that, I'll open it up uh, to your questions. And if you'd like to ask a question, could you please use the Q and A tab, and uh, we'll then make sure to relay the question to our panelists. Um, I believe we have some members of the media with us today. Welcome. And so I just wanted to be, make clear we are on the record. And in addition, we will also be recording this event uh, and posting it on our website. And just to uh, reinforce what Paul said, this is the second of three events that AICGS and CAS are hosting this week. So please register on our website for tomorrow's uh, event on trade and climate. And with that, uh, I'm pleased to hand the floor to Sabina Vayan. Thank you very much and hello from Brussels and I'm very happy to be with you virtually today and looking forward to the discussion and I think uh, uh, both uh, Paul Linnart uh, and uh, uh, Peter Rashish have already set the scene very well. So let me start by answering the question um, that is the title of this panel with a counter question. You're asking, can the US and the EU uh, find common ground to reform the WTO? My question would be, can we afford not to find that common ground? Because the EU and the US have been the main architects uh, for, of the transformation of the GATT into the WTO. And I think with that comes a joint responsibility to also bring the system now into the 21st century. Because we have to recognize that the rules that currently underpin global trade, basically, with some very minor adjustments, uh, are from 1995, 1994, and uh, it is urgent to update them to today's economic realities. 
At the same time, I would argue that there is a large degree of agreement of convergence between the EU and the US in terms of the type of the reform that is needed. And here I'm talking about the rules agenda. What kind of rules do we need to level the playing field in order to deal with the emergence of China? Um, we have to, uh, uh, in this respect, uh, reform the negotiating uh, uh, process, uh, the negotiating function of the WTO to bring more flexibility. We cannot have, we've seen that, it doesn't work if we have a system where negotiations only produce results if all 194 members of the WTO agree. So we have to have a look at plurilaterals. Um, we also need to look at uh, how can the WTO help its members deal with the challenges they face now, notably the challenge of decarbonizing our economies. Again, I think this is an area where our overall objectives between the US and the EU are aligned. I think the EU has a slight advantage here because we haven't had the interruption of the last few years and have moved forward uh, uh, in, in our developing our own domestic policies. Uh, but I think we have every interest to work together in this respect, and we need to see how trade rules can underpin that transformation. The digital economy is another key area where we have to make sure that we get rules, and I think that is one area where plurilateralism uh, will help us land uh, the e-commerce negotiations uh, that we currently have. But then, uh, in addition to the negotiating function, we also need to look at the monitoring function. Because at the moment, I think there's a lot of lack of transparency. We have experienced that at our cost in the current health crisis. Um, and uh, I'm still struggling to understand why you had uh, private institutes that were better able uh, to ensure transparency uh, about the measures that the different WTO members have been taking in the context of the pandemic uh, in terms of uh, export measures, uh, et cetera. Uh, than the WTO Secretariat itself. That is not normal. I think here the members have to give more leeway to the WTO Director General and the Secretariat. Um, and of course, then we have the big issue, which is the reform of the dispute settlement system. Um, and uh, I think it is very clear um, if we agree that we need trade to be rules-based in order to be fair, in order to be sustainable, then these rules need enforcement. And here we have to have a hard look at how to reform the dispute settlement system. Uh, obviously, the disappearance of the appellate body uh, is what focuses minds at the moment. Um, but we are ready to look at more generally at the functioning of the dispute settlement because we see that also the panel stage takes far too long. I think we need to keep in mind that the function of the dispute settlement uh, in the WTO is to help settle disputes. And uh, I, I mean, we have just turned the page on uh, the longest lasting dispute in the WTO uh, between the EU and the US, the Airbus Boeing dispute. And we have decided to move from litigation to cooperation. Uh, but it is also clear that in this case, uh, the, WT, the, the dispute settlement function has not helped uh, the partners to, to find a solution. So I think we need to really streamline the process and make sure that uh, this is, is fit for purpose. So. I think in general, in terms of the outlook, we should have quite a lot of convergence of views between the EU and the US. Now, the new US administration is still reviewing policy. So we are still lacking a lot of detail where they want to go on any of this. From our point of view, it should be possible to translate this convergence in the overall outlook into a commonly agreed strategy. And here we are taking the US administration at its word that it wants to uh, not go it alone, as we have seen in the last four years, but that it wants to work with partners. Um, and I think that's the message they have been sending at the G20, at the G7, uh, at the EU-US uh, summit. And that is something we need to build on. I think at the same time, the message from all the partners of the US, the potential like-minded partners of the US has been, we care deeply about preserving the, and updating the multilateral uh, trading system. So I think this coalition of uh, 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 like-minded countries, of uh, 
democracies, uh, rules-based countries, etc., requires uh, also an engagement by the US in WTO uh, reform. Now we have to work on different elements in, in terms of, of creating this strategy. Um, from our point of view, it would be urgent to pick up uh, the trilateral work. That was one of the few areas of cooperation that we managed to maintain uh, with positive outcomes during the Trump administration. I think we made good progress on subsidies, on SOEs, uh, and on uh, forced technology transfer between the US, Japan, and the EU. Uh, I think we have to pick up that work. We also need to look at what do we do, for instance, on subsidies in a situation where because of the pandemic, uh, the amount of public money poured into the economy has grown enormously everywhere. And we need to coordinate the withdrawal of that. At the same time, so there are some things which are cyclical support, shoring up companies, et cetera, in the context of the pandemic. But then there is also uh, an investment need which will require some public funding in order to uh, ensure the decarbonization of our economies. Again, I think we have to make sure that that does not lead to a subsidies race, to unfair competition and a further unleveled playing field, nor uh, to uh, the build up of overcapacities as, as we have seen by other actors in other sectors. So that requires a hard look at uh, new rules on, on subsidies. On state-owned enterprise, I think we are actually quite well advanced, and uh, I'm sure you discussed uh, also the, yesterday the comprehensive agreement on investment uh, that we have negotiated between the EU and uh, China, and which has very good uh, uh, provisions on state-owned enterprises, which can serve as an inspiration also for the trilateral work. And then we would want to build a larger coalition uh, around this in the WTO with like-minded countries and then reach out to China. Because of course, these rules only make, make sense if China is on board. And here you will of course come and say, yeah, but why would China join these rules which are there basically to contain China? My answer to that is, um, the rules are not there to contain China. The rules are there to make sure that everyone can continue to benefit from a level playing field through the multilateral trading system. And I think we have to engage with China in order to make it clear that countries are no longer willing to accept the distortions that come from its state capitalist system and that they need to contain the impact that their economic system has on the rest of the world. Um, and in this, case, in this context, what we need is of course this development of rules first with like-minded, then in a plurilateral framework in the WTO. But you need to combine the rules, the international rules with domestic tools, because that is needed in order to convince China to come on board that it is in its interest to uh, work on this uh, uh, modernization of the WTO. And of course, the like-minded countries can also work together in the deployment of their autonomous tools. I'm sure we will come back to that in the discussion. Now, what does that mean in the short term? Because I, what I've just sketched out is more than a program uh, for MC12, which is just five months away. Uh, for MC12, I think we need to create a confidence base that the organization can function and provide uh, the necessary update. And here, of course, the fisheries negotiations are a test case. They are the only multilateral negotiation. Uh, we think that there is a chance to have them concluded. Uh, both the US and the EU want to have an outcome that makes a real impact in terms of su sustainability. So this is not a box ticking exercise. At the same time, I think we also have to be careful to avoid that the perfect becomes the enemy of the perfectly good. Um, but here we are waiting for the new text by the chair to come out tomorrow. And then hopefully uh, we can engage under the leadership of Dr. Ngozi uh, to see that we can conclude these negotiations uh, uh, ahead of, of MC12. Um, we should also have an outcome on domestic regulation and services. That's a so-called joint statement initiative, a plurilateral agreement that is on a good track. Investment facilitation is also on a good track, may not be quite totally completed by MC12, but we should have a good result. E-commerce, we need to define a... Uh, uh, um, a, uh, what is the building block we need to reach by MC12 in order to take these negotiations uh, forward. 
We also need to show that the WTO can make a contribution to the current pandemic uh, through a trade and health initiative. Um, uh, so especially uh, we need to make sure that we do everything we can to ensure the availability of uh, vaccines against COVID uh, around the world. We will need something on agriculture. Um, we have uh, made a proposal on transparency, but uh, I think it is very clear that we will also have to have a perspective to work on domestic support. Uh, and that is something uh, we also would like to work on with the United States. Uh, and then MC12 has to be the platform for the, the launch pad for the institutional reform I've been talking about. Um, and we would also want MC12 to send a clear message on uh, environment and climate. Um, and to basically uh, open the door towards uh, negotiations to facilitate uh, trade in uh, goods and services that contribute to fighting climate change. Um, and we need to look at, and I know this is a big issue for the US administration, for the Biden-Harris administration, the social and labor dimension. Now, uh, that is still quite a program. As I said, we have to see what can be done by MC12 and what can be launched at MC12 with a view uh, to the next ministerial conference. Um, but I, to come back to where I started, I think the EU and the US have a joint responsibility to make this work. From my point of view, it is doable and it will certainly not fail because of a lack of engagement uh, from the EU side. And we are looking forward to picking that up with the Biden-Harris administration and with USTR Thai. Uh, with whom uh, my boss, uh, uh, Trade Commissioner Valdis Dombrovskis, has established a good working relationship, which we intend to put to good use over the next few months. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabina. Uh, let me turn first to Rufus Yerksa. Rufus, if I could ask um, for your um, thoughts on what Sabina had to say. She started out by saying the US and the EU can't afford to fail to make progress in the WTO. Uh, how, what's the outlook uh, from your point of view? Well, thank you very much. And I wanna thank the Conrad Audenauer uh, Foundation and uh, for this opportunity. I'm probably one of the few participants that was actually alive as a young school student in uh, the early 1960s when Conrad Audenauer was still chancellor of West Germany. Um, and certainly a lot has happened since that time, but I, I want to compliment Sabine because I think she gave a very good overview of the not only the challenges we face, but <clears throat> the missed uh, opportunities that we will suffer if we don't find a way to work together. Uh, you know, it really is has been a transatlantic endeavor over 70 plus years to build a system uh, of better trade relations. And really at the heart of that system are fundamental things that both Europeans and the United States have traditionally believed in. How do you combine democracy, real meaningful democracy with real meaningful capitalism and also social responsibility uh, balanced against individual rights? And uh, that has been a struggle both for Europeans and Americans you know, the last major revision in the system obviously was 25 years ago in the Uruguay round, and a lot has changed since that time. At that time, it was pretty much accepted that the Americans and Europeans could define a, a, a broad uh, kind of agenda and even reach agreement between each other, which would help to bring the rest of the world together. Although that was a struggle in the Uruguay round, even at that point, and that was before China, Russia, and a number of others had joined the system. It's become more challenging since then to find convergence among a very divergent uh, group of economies. And, and I think if you look at the differences, I would tick off just a couple. Obviously, we all know the growth of China uh, as a major competitor demonstrating that, um, you know, its particular model of economic uh, development presents some challenges under WTO rules, but more than anything, um, there's been a loss of confidence in the West about uh, whether or not our systems can compete with 
the kind of um, system that has evolved in China. Um, but we also have existential threats, global threats that we didn't have before in, in the Uruguay round, obviously um, climate change being, I would argue the biggest one, but also you know, the reality of pandemics and what that means for uh, uh, if countries try to go it alone rather than working together. And of course, the growth of the digital world and the digital economy, which also presents new challenges to us. Um, and, and then the other thing I would argue is that um, we've seen income disparities and wealth distortions grow in a number of countries. We've seen a move to more populist and authoritarian regimes. Sadly, you know, very much a four year experience in the United States, which I think led to a loss of confidence um, in US leadership on the part of our European colleagues. I hope we're back on a better path um, between the Biden administration and uh, European leaders. But let's be realistic. There has been significant divergence between the US and Europe over the last 20 some years on a number of, uh, shall we say, regulatory concepts and policy uh, areas, uh, both in food and agriculture, in the digital economy, even in areas like subsidies. So now, as Sabine says, I think really the test will be, can we work together to find a common agenda? I very much agree with her thesis that it starts with some work, um, the trilateral group, shall we say, among a group of more like-minded governments about how to set up new rules in these areas, uh, whether it be in areas like state-owned enterprises and, and other things that touch on China's policies, whether it be in the climate change regime, whether it be in the digital economy, we work together. We seek to create a broader coalition of countries and then eventually begin to work on how um, we bring China into that sphere. But I think the test will be, for me, the test will be sort of threefold. Uh, I don't think a new WTO agenda can be acceptable, certainly politically acceptable in the United States if it doesn't address some of the fundamental issues about the divergences between our system and China's system. That's the first thing. Secondly, I don't think it would be a relevant agenda unless it does address the growth of the digital economy, what the digital world means for trade. It, it presents tremendous opportunities and promise for the future, but it also presents regulatory challenges where Europe and the United States need to close the gap. I fundamentally believe that we can close that gap, that we have some different regulatory philosophies, but we had those in the past in areas where we were successful in creating new WTO rules. In fact, the whole realm of services and intellectual property, we had regulatory divergences in the 90s that the US and Europe succeeded in overcoming. But I think an agenda won't be relevant unless it addresses this fast growing uh, digitalization of, um, of the world economy. And finally, I don't think it will be an agenda that will truly serve our future needs unless it does successfully address sustainability and here, you know, everything from climate change to uh, preservation of resources to making trade uh, more environmentally and socially, uh, shall we say, fair and um, serving broader social interests. And that's gonna be to me, one of the biggest challenges. Having worked for business for many years and also having been a negotiator for governments, I know that this trade-off between doing the responsible thing, both for the environment and for uh, social stability, while at the same time not uh, creating new forms of economic distortions, protectionism, uh, and uh, restrictions on commerce that the business community will contest. So that's going to be, to me, the biggest part of the challenge is not just how we find convergence with each other, but how we convince a broad, broad uh, universe of stakeholders that this future agenda is balanced, it's reasonable, it serves 
the, the fundamental purposes of the WTO was there for, which was to create fairer and more open commerce among nations, while at the same time serving all of these other important new priorities that we recognize have to be addressed, like climate change. Thank you, Rufus. Um, Gabriel, um, Sabina Vayan mentioned um, climate and digital. She also mentioned the importance of like-minded. I heard that echoed in a lot of what Rufus said. Do you share some of these, um, this broad agenda and or anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, thank you, uh, Peter. Thanks for having me uh, in today's session. Um, and I think uh, Sabine and Rufus already said, uh, uh, very clever things, and I, I don't find myself in disagreement at all, so I, I have a, 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 you know, a difficult task here. I, th I think one aspect is maybe worth reiterating. Sabine kind of said it without saying it, namely she was mentioning in her the first part of her little speech the, the long-term uh, issues, you know, how, how to, to make the WTO fit for, let's say, the next 25 years, for its second half of life, let's say. And, in, and then in the second part, she was talking about the ongoing problems, no? fisheries, uh, e-commerce, um, agriculture. She could have talked about plastics, waste, <laughs> and many more things. No, they look small, but I think they are extremely important. We have maybe, who knows, two years, maybe four years of a transatlantic window. Hopefully it's longer, but we don't know. And so I think what we really need across the Atlantic is to convince people that the WTO is indeed important. You know, when we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the WTO at the Kiel Institute for Bertelsmann Foundation, we tried to estimate with some colleagues uh, from, from Philadelphia, tried to, to estimate what is the benefit of having the WTO. And it's just so obvious from an economics point of view and so clear in the numbers, how big the societal benefits of a global uh, rule system that works, that's enforceable, that's transparent, is no? so the value is very big but that is very abstract and i think what people need to see is how the how the wto is actually helping solve the problems that we face rather than being an obstacle and i think in its in its first 25 years wto was often seen as as you know as as hindering solutions and even now you know when we talk about carbon border adjustment mechanisms um you know, there's the, the biggest concern, and probably rightful so, but the, the big concern is, are those rules that we're designing, are those instruments that we're designing WTO consistent? And then many people say, well, why do we care, right? We need, we need higher carbon prices in Europe and elsewhere, and we need to make sure that the decarbonization process doesn't also deindustrialize our economies. And if we are now running into problems with WTO law, so be it, right? And, and one problem, for example, is that Many believe in order to make a European CPEM consistent with WTO law, we have to um, uh, we have to exempt exports. No, we cannot we cannot include uh, equalization uh, at the export side. From an economic point of view, we would want to do that to keep to keep our firms in business on export markets and at the same time end free allocation uh, of uh, uh, of uh, CO two allowances. And so I think I think the WTO needs to. Be, become part of, of the solution rather than being seen by many across the Atlantic as, as part of the problem. And to, to build that, these, these uh, immediate little projects are so important. Now, fisheries, this is about sustainability. This is about restoring fish stocks in our oceans. Um, the plastics, uh, uh, plastic waste, I mean, the people deeply care about that. And I think uh, if the WTO fails in November to deliver on this, this will also make the, the road ahead much more bumpy because what we need is support uh, from you know, activists, uh, from voters um, for the process to, 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 to be successful at the end. I, I agree quite fully uh, with the analysis that we heard about the role of plurilaterals, Peter. You, you mentioned that too. I think it's, we, this is maybe something that we Europeans can also bring into the discussion because we have been living with enormous amounts of heterogeneity within the EU and we are used to concepts like uh, you know variable speed or variable geometry or you know th these things where um, we had a discussion about unanimity uh, in many areas and, and found solutions we're not yet there I guess not at the EU level neither but I think we have 
we have uh, experience to bring into the process. And I also think that you know, making the, uh, the, the secretariat more um, effective in Geneva and, 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 and giving it more rights of initiative is something that, that we know has worked in Europe. I mean, we have a commission in Europe that, um, that, that does a lot of thinking. You know, for the council, maybe I'm misportraying the situations of being there, but but that's how I see it. The, the commission pr produces solutions, and then the council says yes or no, and then so on. But but that's not what we what we have uh, uh, at the WTO right now uh, with just the technical uh, technical uh, secretariat. The uh, the thing that that uh, that uh, um, frightens me a little bit is is as Sabine also mentioned it how incentivizing China. And yes, we need instruments, but we want these instruments as, you know, as, as game theorists would say, we need them off equilibrium. We don't want to use them. We want them to be there, uh, you know, um, if something goes wrong, but we don't want anything to go wrong, of course. And, and so this is, this is a, you know, this is a very difficult task to, on the one hand, uh, build these instruments, um, uh, also seek, seek, um, let's say, consistency with, with partners like uh, Japan or the U US in these instruments, and then make sure that we don't actually have to use them. You know, I, I think the analogy that is probably wrong, but at least a little bit insightful nonetheless, is the one with, um, with the Cold War, where both sides invested into instruments, built up those arsenals, and then uh, never used them. Um, but they, they allowed, you know, the world to coexist uh, more or less peacefully for, for a long period in time. And so, but, but I'm afraid of this, that we build up instruments and then we actually end up using them. And then we do uh, produce what we don't want to have, namely a decoupled global economy with China and its satellites at one place and, and the West in another place. And I think that that's also modeling that tells us that would be quite expensive more expensive actually for Europe, way more expensive for Europe, to be honest, uh, than for the United States. Uh, we would suffer more from a decoupling from China in, in the EU than, uh, than the US, US would, but we would both suffer. You know? uh, it's not a question whether we would suffer, but you know, Europe would probably uh, be, be uh, affected a little bit more. So, and the last point maybe to, to, to say that, that connects to what I said before, to, to you know, making sure that, that People support the WTO project. Um, that has to do with Corona, no, and uh, and with um, with the question uh, of the of the trips waiver. You know, that's where where I'm not clear. Maybe the Americans here can update us here, but I, I'm not clear anymore what the American position is. Maybe we have convergence there. You know, where we had divergence maybe a couple of weeks ago. Maybe something has changed. It has escaped my mind. But I do know that my students. Uh, deeply care about that, no? and, and we should also care in Germany and elsewhere. We, we see that, you know, new Corona cases in some Chinese uh, ports, you know, lead to huge problems in, in international logistics. So, uh, you know, again, that's one area where I think in November at the MC12, it will be too late, actually. You know, we, we need it earlier. We need earlier, uh, you know, the clear message to the world that the WTO is not actually hindering a process, but it's it's producing solutions. If we if you fail on that, I'm not sure whether the multilateral system has a good future. Thanks. Well, let me let me ask a, a question to all three of you that, that that follows up a bit in what what you just said. I mean, Gabriel, if I understand your point, you're saying that with this analogy to the Cold War, that we need ex anti uh, deterrent tools, but it would be kind of a tragedy if we have to actually use them ex post. So my question would be, if you're actually looking at the trade field, right, you're looking at the tools that are traditionally available to trade policy, are there, can that toolkit be strong enough to deter uh, sort of antisocial global economic behavior um, and be, be credible? Um, while still being consistent with WTO rules. In other words, isn't it, isn't there, isn't, can, can you know, to really have two tools that would deter, let's say, chi Chinese behavior that we don't like, can all of those tools really uh, be consistent with the functioning of the WTO? Or to really be effective as a deterrent, would there need to be at least some stepping on the line? 
Mm. Yeah, Peter, you asked the right question. I don't think uh, that the instruments we need are per se consistent with WTO rules. Um, you know, we, we, we've been thinking about uh, a climate club uh, produced a paper at the uh, at the scientific advisory report of the German economics minister ministry, and we we deviated from what Nobel Prize winner uh, Bill Nordhaus proposed. He was actually proposing very brutal uh, uh, punitive duties on those who free ride on uh, on climate efforts, and. You know, we were saying, well, that that's surely not consistent with WTO law. We need we need to make, you know, the, the punishment, if I can say so. We need we need to make it contingent on on actual climate policies in the countries we're talking about. No, um, but doing that waters down the process. It makes the instrument much less powerful. So there are, I think, very reasonable doubts to to, to think that the climate club that that protects its its. Uh, that protects itself with just the CBAM will not incentivize others sufficiently to, to contribute because the CBAM, as we can design it, consistent with WTO rules, is too weak, right? So th that shows that we are, that, that the question you ask is, is, super, is super relevant. And, um, but to the extent that, you know, we, we I think at the very extreme transatlantic community and Europe must be ready to sacrifice WTO rules. I mean, I, I, I'm saying that, and I hope you know that I'm a, 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 a true fan of the multilateral system. But we, it's, it's like it's like saying, you know, if the, you know, like that central bankers sometimes need to do the unthinkable to to do their jobs, um, and never then at the end do it really. You no, know? so so the, but at the end, I think that we, we need to we need in extremis uh, we, we need to. Um, we need to take those red lines out you know, of the thinking, because otherwise they would they would new to our uh, the, the, they would new to the threats uh, we need to put on the table to 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 bring countries like China, not just China, no? it's, it's not just China. I would say no? with India, Russia, with many more countries, no, to to, to make uh, con their contributions to the, what we call global public goods uh, actually happen. Sabina or Rufus, would you like to respond to that idea that at least for to have deterrent effect, let's say we may have to um, be willing to, to step on some lines? Well, if I may, because of course that has uh, triggered immediately a reaction from me. Uh, first of all, I think on this issue of uh, rules and the tools the, uh, we were talking about, I'm not talking only about rules that we would only use or instruments we would only use when things go wrong. There are some of those. For instance, we are working on an anti-coercion instrument in the EU, not targeted at any country, but in case a country steps out of the uh, international uh, rule of law and basically tries to coerce certain behavior on the part of the EU or its member states, we must be able to take counteraction. That is indeed the type of instrument that we hope we would never have to use. But there are other instruments we are talking about in the security field, our 5G toolbox on the EU side, um, uh, 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 the FDI screening, which is not an economic, it's a security instrument, where it is highly important and we do use it. And we've only started developing a European doctrine about this, building on the member states, but that is something we are using. In the, economic, in the economic side, we want to use the foreign uh, uh, subsidies instrument because we see that there are distortions on the uh, single market created by foreign subsidies. And of course, we have the whole framework of trade defense action, uh, which we are using uh, in order to deal with the overcapacity problem we currently face. So there are economic instruments that we are using, which are not uh, of equilibrium uh, instruments. And then we have the whole values issue. Um, and I think we have to show that we can take action to prevent products uh, uh, produced with forced labor to end up on our markets. So these are things we actually want to use. The same on deforestation. Uh, yes, it should also uh, disincentivize uh, deforestation. But, you know, we will have to act because uh, uh, we will want to make sure that this does not uh, move forward. So that's that's one uh, of the issues I wanted uh, uh, one of the comments I wanted to make. 
The other one is on the WTO as an impediment. Um, if you look so far, if you look back, I don't think you will find a genuine environmental measure that has been prohibited or fallen foul of WTO rules. There are certain criteria you have to fulfill, and that makes sense because what is the problem we are trying to solve? It's a problem of global, uh, global commons, as, as uh, uh, Mr. Felbermayr said. Now, how do you do that through cooperation? And from that point of view, any individual instruments need to be designed that they foster that cooperation and do not hinder it. And let's take the example of CBAM. I think it is, I mean, CBAM is one tiny element of climate policy. What really matters is that we agree amongst the major emitters and economies on carbon pricing and that we link up our systems that ensure carbon pricing. The, the border adjustment mechanism is necessary as long as ambitions are not aligned and in order to, uh, to avoid carbon leakage. You can design that perfectly well uh, within WTO rules. WTO rules are not hindering that. Where it becomes an issue is when you are not using CBAM as a climate measure, but if you use it to say, I'm going to level the playing field here, I use it as a competitiveness instrument, then you run into trouble. Now, the distinction is in the detail, and that is where I think the monitoring function of the WTO needs to be strengthened so that we actually have a conversation where people take their national climate measures to Geneva and explain how they work, but also explain how they are ready to link up with other systems. So from that point of view, uh, I fully agree we should not argue, if, if people don't like the CBAM, and there are people, including in the, in the business sector who don't like CBAM, they should not use the WTO as an excuse because it isn't one. We can perfectly well design a, a CBAM as a climate measure in line with WTO rules. And I think the WTO is suffering from the fact where people claim that something they don't like for other reasons would fall foul of, of WTO rules. So, um, but I mean, we will come forward with our proposal. But again, here, that in a way, CBAM is an off equilibrium measure because our real objective is to agree with the G20 countries, the big emitters on climate neutrality. If we manage that, CBAM becomes irrelevant. What we need is a global carbon pricing policy and CBAM can incentivize that. But ideally, if our climate policy succeeds, if our international climate cooperation succeeds, there wouldn't be a need for CBAM. So let's see how we can get uh, uh, to that point. Rufus, did you want to comment? Yeah, Peter, I, I, I just sort of, you know, perspective from this side of the Atlantic, this is not an opinion I have, this is just a perspective of where the U.S. is politically. Um, you know, the big challenge in the U.S. will be developing legislation that really does something with carbon pricing and uh, the uh, incentives for lower carbon uh, economy uh, because right now, politically, that's going to be very, very difficult uh, challenge. Uh, Biden administration is is has that in its uh, in its agenda. But let's be realistic about what the problems are. And I think I I, I would agree with Sabine's analysis. I mean, I I, I would don't think on the one hand I don't think it's realistic that the WTO becomes a forum for really setting the world's carbon pricing policy. That's what the WTO will be is um, it will have to address the consequences of any agreements that are reached on carbon pricing. So as she says, to create the necessary um, adjustment in WTO rules um, to permit that. So it, to me, it's a little bit premature to be talking about, you know, our, do countries have to, you know, be willing to you know, uh, uh, ignore WTO rules. We're, we're not even to that. We're a long way from that point yet, certainly in the environmental sphere. And like she says, there really aren't impediments that the WTO has presented to these environmental agreements. I mean, there were some early cases, uh, but if you look at the more recent history of, of WTO dispute settlement, uh, 
well, a lot of environmental activists like to use the WTO as a bogeyman, it really hasn't been the problem. The problem has been getting societies to agree to the trade-offs between you know, what it does for their economic, their current economic activities versus the long-term gains from, um, from better carbon pricing. Thanks. Um, let, let me um, shift just a little, little bit. Um, the the Biden administration, um, I think, it's it's you know it has said quite openly that it's still working on its on its uh, the overall contours of its trade policy, um, and that includes its approach to the WTO. Um, you know, we, we've seen in the EU's trade policy review that, it, and, and you've said um, too, Sabina, that they, they, you'd like to see a relaunch of the WTO's appellate body. Um, what what steps concretely um, do, do you all think would be helpful um, you know, from the US administration, either before or once it has its um, trade policy um, under its belt. What what would be the steps you'd like to see um, come from the administration, and but, you know, with those steps, um, how optimistic would you be that um, by the time of the next ministerial meeting um, that that the U.S. and EU together can make plans? Sabina, would you like to take a crack at that first? Look, I think we've been leaning uh, very much uh, forward uh, in our recent uh, trade policy strategy, uh, where we have recognized a lot of the grievances that US administrations uh, uh, and uh, people in Congress from both sides of the aisle have been voicing uh, with respect to the functioning of the dispute settlement. And what we have said is, we are ready to enter into any uh, discussion about what to do we only have, you know, uh, a few principles that need to be preserved, and they are the principles that the WTO membership agreed on 25 years ago, and that is that it has to be independent, it has to be binding, a two-step process. Um, and uh, 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 within, uh, within that, those parameters, we are ready to look at any sort of adjustment that is necessary. There is already, there has good, good work was done in the WTO uh, under the chairmanship of Ambassador Walker from New Zealand. We can build on that. So what are we looking for from the US? I mean, we accept they are doing their review. We accept that they have a bipartisan constituency that needs to be convinced. But at the same time, I think what we would like to see is that they recognize um, that they're working with allies in order to level the playing field requires an update of the rule book and that that only makes sense if you also have a functioning dispute settlement and that they are working with their partners in the WTO to make that happen. I think what we need is a work program which basically says this will lead to a functioning dispute settlement uh, 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 process again by the next WTO uh, ministerial. We do not expect this to happen within the next five months. We are not naive. So we are not going to kill the process by being overly ambitious. But at the same time, what we need to see is a clear sense of engagement and a recognition that you need rules and their enforcement, especially, but not only, to also uh, 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 integrate China into the world trading system in a, matter, in a manner which is uh, acceptable for everyone else. Um, and that this is a clear, uh, that they distance themselves clearly from the previous administration, which tried to negotiate rules bilaterally and enforce them unilaterally at great cost to the US economy. So I think this recognition also of economic reality would already be a very good starting point. And then we are ready to engage with them. And we know this is a process which will take a, a certain amount of time because there are reluctant constituencies that need to be brought on board. But from our point of view, we have recognized the need also for an overhaul. And as I said, we are not, we are not saying, well, let's renominate appellate body uh, 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 members and then we are done. No, we need to look at the whole functioning of the system 
including the panel stage. Uh, because at the moment, I mean, we have to recognize in the past, the system has not delivered uh, the help to parties, to members, to settle disputes that the system was created for. Thank you. Um, Rufus or Gabriel, any comments on that? What, what, what well, we could expect or wish from the US administration? Yeah, I do have a couple of comments. I mean, first of all, you have to realize, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I was part of the, uh, the ancien regime that, that set up this dispute settlement system and that agreed to finding an effective dispute settlement as part of the Uruguay round grand bargain. Um, and I fundamentally believe in the importance, if you're going to have rules and they're going to be meaningful, you have to have some way of, of really resolving these disputes. And I think, I think that there, there, while there were problems with some of the past rulings and, and jurisprudence in areas like public body, for example, that gave rise to some legitimate concerns. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's any question, but that it would be foolhardy to go into a full-fledged reform of the system if we aren't serious about having some way of arbitrating disputes. We can argue that it became too legalistic. It became too dependent on, on you know, too many kinds of legal intricacies in this two-stage process that's being described, but, you know, there already has been a lot of work done on, on how to um, reform that in a meaningful way and get it back on track. Um, I think it does begin to merge, though, with a reform agenda. It, it's hard for me to believe that you can't have progress in getting the dispute mechanism back working if you don't have progress on a fundamental reform agenda. I'm not necessarily outlining what that sequence has to be. What I'd like to see the US do, frankly, you know, is move away from a lot of the unilateralist measures it took over the last four years. Uh, I'd like to see us get away from these national security restrictions on, on products like steel and aluminum, the misuse of, of national security, um, particularly with respect to our best trading partners and allies who you know, it runs totally contrary to the notion of strengthening our national security by using this. I'd like to see, I'm glad to see progress on settling some big cases like Airbus Boeing, because those are fundamental challenges to the effectiveness of the system. And if the US and Europe can't resolve issues like that, and by the way, that dispute's been around, you know, since I was a negotiator um, in several different iterations, and it is time now if we really want to face the challenges of the future to resolve some of those outstanding problems. And then I think we can move towards a better framework for discussing disputes. I, mean, I think the Biden administration needs some political space and time because of their precarious uh, uh, politics at home with the president having very, very slim majorities and, and a Republican party that unfortunately has walked away from a commitment to multilateralism and open trade in a very disturbing way. Uh, and so he's got difficult challenges here to face, but, but I hope those will help to reinforce greater uh, cooperation between Europe and the US and that would strengthen Biden's hand politically. Thank you, Rufus. And as I don't want to stand in the way of anybody's uh, soccer or uh, football watching opportunities, let me just say that I th think um, during this discussion, we really didn't shy away from some of the tough institutional and political questions. And I, to me, it uh, because, because of that, it, it really lays the groundwork, I think, for some further work. So um, I want to thank, uh, first of all, Sabina Vion for joining us again here at AICGS. Uh, Gabrielle Feldmar, also and Rufus Jurgis for joining us the first time. And I hope we can find another good opportunity to continue this discussion, which I enjoyed and hope that our, our viewers did as well. Th so thanks to everyone watching uh, in the United States as well as in Europe. And don't forget to register for tomorrow's event where we will pick up, in fact, on some of these issues related to trade and climate. Bye-bye.